Yovan Buha! Buha! Yo, yo, I'm Yovan Buha, Lakers beat writer for The Athletic, and welcome to episode 31 of Buha's Block. Today, I am thrilled to be joined by Sam Vecini, the senior NBA writer for The Athletic and the host of the Game Theory podcast. Sam, how are you doing today, tomorrow? I'm not really sure at the time difference, uh, but uh, how are things going for you? I'm just excited not to be standing next to you and looking up at you. You know, you're a good foot taller, not a full foot, but like pretty close to a foot taller than me. So it's nice to nice to be on level pegging here in terms of just looking at the same in our images. It's very, it's very nice. How, uh, how busy is this time of the year for you? Laughably laughably like i'm trying to coordinate so i do prospect interviews over on the youtube channel for game theory where i'm like trying to coordinate multiple of those and then trying to talk to teams and talk to agents about things to get intel and you know i finished the draft guide which is really important so that's off the books and that's coming at some point next week uh so now it's just like trying to figure out how the lay of the land is going to go and i don't know if you've heard yovan but not too many people are excited about the top of this draft, which means that there's a whole lot of uncertainty about the top of this draft. So uh, legitimately, like nobody knows who's going to go number one at this point. I'm not sure the Atlanta Hawks know what they're going to do at number one at this point even. So it is, in fact, I think I would go as far as to say, I don't think the Atlanta Hawks know what they're going to do at number one at this point. So it's going to be a really, really fun night, I think, especially for Lakers fans, because this little group of the draft here, I would say from number eight, to number 18 or so that's probably my favorite range of the draft and i think that that is the the piece of the draft that is strongest comparatively to past drafts okay that that's a uh, positive piece of news for laker fans i you know no one's been really excited for the draft and uh, that there's been the the kind of <laughs> theory out there that it's basically like chopping off the first seven or eight picks of a typical draft and starting at like pick number eight yeah. or pick number nine, which if you're then drafting at number 17 means you're picking at pick 26 or, or 27. Uh, so Lakers are maybe getting like a, a late first round talent, but their track record has been pretty strong over the past decade, especially in those like late first round, early second round picks. But um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention we are recording this Wednesday afternoon Pacific time and Lakers and NBA legend Jerry West passed away this morning at 86. Uh, so just wanted to acknowledge that and say rest in peace to him. Uh, I know we, everyone talks about Magic Johnson and Kobe Bryant as Mr. Laker or, or the greatest Laker of all time. And they are certainly... The, the top two or two of the top three, but I think Jerry West belongs in that conversation. When you look at, you know, only one, one championship as a player, but was the architect of the 1980s Showtime Lakers uh, signed Shaquille O'Neal and drafted or draft traded the rights for Kobe Bryant in the same week, which is arguably the greatest week uh, any executive has had in sports history, let alone NBA history. So yeah. uh, you, you look at the three peat with Kobe and Shaq, you look at the eighties championships uh, you know, he technically only won six as an executive, but uh, I'm going to include the other two Kobe Shaq titles and, and say he won eight. So an incredible one, uh, run for for Jerry West. And that's not even mentioning helped legitimize Memphis as an organization, helped build the Warriors dynasty, uh, helped get Kawhi and PG to the Clippers, also drafted Shea Gilgis Alexander you know, as part of that crew. So just his resume is unparalleled as a general manager, uh, as an evaluator for talent and I uh, just wanted to acknowledge that before we start. Yeah, I, I think that that's a great way to put it. I think that, you know, not growing up in the 1960s, I think of Jerry West as this guy who's always around every event that I go to, it feels like, right, to scout and yeah. to evaluate. And, you know, it's undeniable that he's had this immense impact on the way that teams are built even. I think that what's most impressive is a lot of, executives as they age and as they you know kind of get further and further removed from their playing career get further and further removed from when they had had success previously oftentimes they struggle to adjust to where the league is going in some way shape or form and jerry west constantly adjusted and constantly uh figured out different ways in order to see where the league is going and have that foresight and vision. 
and I think he deserves an immense amount of credit for that as much as anything. You know, the Warriors were at the forefront of this, obviously, but, you know, understanding the Kobe Shaq dynamic, understanding that we were entering an era of star power, even more so than what we had been previously across the league as, you know, the hand checking rules and things had kind of dissipated a little bit in the early 2000s. And I think that his impact on the league just really, really can't go overstated i think that uh he, he has just been such a remarkably profound presence across the league uh and seriously again like you know he was at summer league last year like he's been he goes to he went to every event scouting wise that he could go to and it felt like he just like truly loved being at those events and like loved the game in that way yeah no, it's uh, it's really remarkable the the career that he had, and and just being able to kind of to what you were saying, like adapt to each era and identify talent and the best way to structure a team within that era. Because building a team in 1980 is much different than building a team in 2020. But he was great at both, and uh, that just speaks to his love for the game. That speaks to his intelligence, his eye for talent, his eye for development, and all those great qualities, and, and just that competitive like. He, he, he was an MFer, right? Like he, he just, he, he was competitive. He, he called himself a wolf uh, among dogs. And like, I, I thought that was just like a perfect way to sum him up. Uh, but no easy transition, but let, let's get into the number 17 pick because I think that is something that Lakers theoretically should have a head coach uh, before the uh, NBA draft in uh, a couple of weeks. But uh <laughs> Uh, let, let's let's start with the the number seventeen pick though. Um, so in your latest mock draft, you have Tristan De Silva going at number seventeen, uh, and that was uh, about a week ago. Uh, so what 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 do you think the Lakers would see in that pick if he is available, and, and what do you think about his potential fit in LA? Yeah, just a multi talented, versatile six foot eight wing in big wings across the league or in vogue you're trying to find guys with a bunch of different skills right who can dribble past shoot and certainly tristan can dribble past shoot he is someone who is very comfortable moving off the ball i think that's the big thing that really stands out with him the way that he's able to uh cut into uh you can occasionally run off of screens and be able to create open space for stars uh, i think that that was always the thing that really stood out most with him to me at colorado and as he matured into being a junior and senior he took on a bigger load of the offensive burden and was able to grab and go on the break and knock down 39 percent of his threes over the course of his time uh over the last two years and then on top of it uh, i think he's like a pretty solid positional defender too he's not the most athletic guy in the world but he is very capable of sitting down and guarding the big concern that people have with tristan is the intersection of athleticism and toughness kind of uh he's not like a not tough player but he is not a particularly good rebounder for his size at six foot eight he averages under five rebounds per game uh, over the course of the last two years and there is a concern that he might be more of a four athletically in terms of movement skills so what you would need to do in order to make tristan de silva work is you need to have great rebounders around him and the good news with the Los Angeles Lakers is currently they have LeBron James and Anthony Davis around him, which would be completely fine. And, you know, in the case of, you know, some of the guards, I think that Austin Reeves, you know, would be a perfect fit with him. And I think that uh, you just look across what the Lakers have coming up with some of their younger guys. I think that uh, De Silva would be a really, really good addition for them. And uh, I, I definitely get the impression that they're at least somewhat interested. The Lakers, and we've had this conversation before, um, but I've also written about this, reported about it. The Lakers tend to draft based on best player available and not necessarily by uh, position or need or potential. Uh, for them, it's just like, who is the best player? Who do we think, uh, you know, if we're ranking these guys, you know, they'll have their big board and they'll have their composite ranking and they will just, you know, tend to go by that list. And as I mentioned earlier, they have basically as, impressive of a draft track record as any team over the last 10 12 years uh they, they found a lot of gems late first round second round undrafted g league 
uh, even some some misses in terms of like a, a guy like Gary Payton the second was in their system and they let him go and then he became a high level role. So like th- their track record is very very impressive uh, with identifying talent. Um, have you gotten like because looking at the roster, I think the one thing they probably don't need is a guard, uh, and it could depend on what happens with D'Angelo Russell and do they right. go after a third star and and like and that would probably be a perimeter player but uh so there's still some ways that the roster could change where they might need a guard in the draft uh but they go and take uh Jalen Hutchifino last year who uh projects as sort of a combo guard or, or maybe even more of a lead ball handler uh but you know kind of with with that context do you think they are going to lean more toward a 3 and D wing or a front court player because that I guess just looking at how the roster and, and the limited means to improve the roster, if you can hit on an athletic big who can protect the rim and eat eight to 15 minutes off the bench behind Anthony Davis or even play next to him or get a De Silva uh, who could you know, could plug in as a eighth or ninth man and and that, you know, be someone that you know, fulfills that role in your rotation. Like, I, I think that's more valuable than potentially adding like another guard who's now competing with potentially D'Lo, Austin, Gabe, Max Christie, if they retain him, that's to say nothing of them maybe going out and getting a star who would suck up, you know, 35 to 40 minutes a night, depending on who that player is. So uh, with that context of like what the Lakers need and and with how roster building is starting to change and and the importance of drafting well and uh, developing those guys and and using the draft to kind of plug in some of your holes, uh, do you still see the Lakers going more down that best player available route and maybe a point guard slips to them that should have been a lottery pick and, and they take that guy? Or do you see it being more like, you know, we, we need some more size and athleticism on the wing and in the front court, and we should probably draft one of those types of guys? Yeah, I mean, the thing is that, you know, I think that there's a non-zero chance that somebody like Rob Dillingham slips to 16, right? And Rob Dillingham, I think, would be helpful for them. Like he, I don't know how you felt, but like if D'Angelo Russell was to not be on this team next year, they would really need like a shot creator of some sort. And I think that Rob Dillingham can come in and like create shots in some regard. The issue with with Rob particularly, and to an extent with Isaiah Collier to really a lesser extent, to be honest, because Isaiah is uh, just a bit of a lesser prospect in my opinion than Rob is. I think that their defense would be like a real hindrance, especially early in their careers. Like Rob Dillingham is not going to be able to come in and play defense at an NBA level from day one. Uh, he is like probably going to be one of the worst defenders in the league from day one. Uh, he's just very skinny and very small and was very bad away from the ball this year at Kentucky. And that's not to say he can't improve. These kids are teenagers, right? Like they will get better. But early on in his career, it's going to be a real problem. I thought Isaiah Collier, you know, L.A. fans like might be familiar. He went to USC. I thought he was quite bad defensively this season. And it will be interesting to see how they react to somebody like Isaiah Collier if he's potentially on the board, given the presence of Jalen Hutchfino, who I think that they believe can play some as a secondary ball handler point guard. I don't know if they see him as like an Austin Reeves who can like, you know, really like play full scale point guard. But I would imagine that they at least see him as somebody who can handle some minutes at that position. So the only position I would see them avoiding is kind of a position locked point guard that would not really be able to transition off the ball. Like I think Dillingham can play off the ball. Like if he was there at 17 and I felt like I was about to lose D'Angelo Russell, I would probably take Rob Dillingham if I was the Los Angeles Lakers. If Isaiah Collier was there, I worry about Isaiah Collier playing off the ball because I worry about the jumper at this point right now. And I think he's best as a downhill athlete really getting to the rim. I would probably not take Isaiah Collier if I was them. Having said that, like I know that Devin Carter went and worked out with the Los Angeles Lakers and, you know, they had some real degree of interest there. So I don't think they're necessarily avoiding the backcourt with the Lakers or anything like that. I don't think Devin Carter is going to get to 17 by any stretch of the imagination. Like I I would put that at like a 0.005% chance of him getting to 17, but I think that they will probably avoid that singular lead ball handler archetype more than anything. And beyond that, like I've heard bigs are on the board. Like I've heard uh, like the wings, the three and D types that you're saying are on the board. Like, I I think that they will 
again, as you mentioned at the top, this is a team that really tends to value just the best player that they like on their board at the end of the day. And they're not going to care if he's 19 years old, like Jalen Huchifino was last year. And they're not going to care if he is 22 or 21 or a senior, like they've proven in the past with guys like Larry Nance, for instance. Right. So they're just going to take who the best player is on their board. But I think that I would be surprised if it was a position locked point guard would be my only thing. You mentioned several names at that 17 spot now throughout this conversation. Are, are there any other guys you like that could potentially be available yeah. outside of some of the ones you've said? Yeah, I'll be honest with you. I think Zach Eady would be an ass kicker with the Lakers. I, I think actually awesome. I answered this on a mailbag recently. I, <laughs> I really like the fit as a backup setter. I think he'd be awesome. I think he could come in immediately and play. Uh, he is way better in drop coverage than what he gets credit for. I think his back pedal sometimes in drop gets a little bit funky and he needs to like continue to clean up that footwork. But man, he is in so much better shape than what I think like NBA fans recognize. Uh, I do worry about him getting like up and down the court, but in terms of like conditioning, in terms of being able to play out games, he's not this like big lumbering dude that people think like I have him right now on my board at 16, right? Like I really like Isaiah Cal or, uh, Zach Eady. Like, I think he can really, really go uh, in terms of being able to establish position. I think he's the best screener in the draft. Uh, I think that like him and Austin Reeves would like have some real fun together because uh, he's really good at like screening. He's really good at angling his screens. Like he had to create separation for guys like Braden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer last year. And those guys are not super athletic, like just point blank. Like I like Braden. I think he's, you know, a guy that might end up on a two way in the NBA at some point. But Zach was a big piece of him being able to separate. They'd roll him into lobs. They'd roll him into post-ups pretty regularly. And, and he was just really, really capable in those settings. I really like Zach Eady in that respect. Uh, I love the fit of Kyle Filipowski for them. I think Filipowski would be fantastic as like a backup uh, big who could play with or without Anthony Davis. I think that Filipowski's movement skill laterally has gone really underrated. Uh, he's not super explosive vertically or anything, but he is not some like stiff white dude. Like I think he gets pigeonholed as from time to time. Uh, he is pretty flexible in terms of his ability to handle the ball. Like he's a real ball handler at six foot 11. He is a real ball handler uh, who can like break down mass matchups, like at mismatch five situations. Right. I think he can shoot. I think he can pass. And if you look at the NBA finals, those kind of stretch fives, those five out lineups, those are the lineups that I think are really difficult to deal with for NBA teams. Because at the end of the day, if you can pull the big away from the rim, it makes it really hard to play a non-shooting big against shooting bigs, especially if they have to respect them as shooters. Now, you know, Filipowski getting to a level where he has to be respected as a shooter, like Kelly Olenek, that will come over the next couple of years. He's not quite there yet, in my opinion, but I think he will get there. The last name that I would bring up is Eve Missy here. Uh, Eve Missy is just like the super athletic, you know, nine foot one ish standing reach guy who, you know, 6'10 or so, 6'11 ish, 7'2 wingspan, but enormous vertical gravity, like huge leaper gets off the ground in such a significant way, can move his feet, but is like really positionally all over the place right now and like drop coverage and trying to learn where he has to go rotationally and things. I think he's a little bit more of a project, but athletically, if you're looking for like a Clint Capella lob starter kit, so you don't have to play AD at the five as often, and that might be something that AD prefers, obviously, as we've seen throughout the course of his career, I think Eve Missy would be a pretty interesting candidate there too. And then have you heard anything about them potentially trading this pick? Because as we know, the Lakers have three tradable first round picks, 2024, 2029, and 2031. Uh, Lakers vice yeah. president of basketball operations and general manager Rob Palinka said at the deadline that part of them standing pat was they only had one pick to trade and by the draft that they would be able to trade three picks. Uh, I guess I believe it's starting that morning. They have access to, or the second it, it's past midnight, they have the access to all three first round picks. Um, so what, what have you heard in terms of the buzz around the number 17 pick and then potentially moving it? And I think back to last year where 
there was a lot of buzz. I had reported on them potentially moving that pick. They had looked into moving that pick and ultimately weren't able to find a deal uh, and also was coincidentally number 17 as well. But uh, with, I guess, going back to us talking about this draft and how no one loves this draft and and how you know maybe there are some gems in, in the middle of it, but like, what does what the number 17 pick in this draft even have value-wise in, in a trade? And uh, what are you hearing with the Lakers in, in 17? Yeah, I think that the impression I've gotten with them, in addition to a number of teams in that range, like Philadelphia, Phoenix, uh, et cetera, right? Like there are a few different teams in that like post lottery range that I think are just open to a lot of different things, right? Uh, I'm not going to sit here and tell you they're going to trade the pick. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that they're not going to trade the pick. I- I've gotten the impression that they're open to different avenues if they feel like the team is, uh, if they feel like they can make the team take a real substantial leap at the end of the day. Uh, what deal out there would make sense with that, I think is a genuine question that I don't have an answer to at this point. Uh, in terms of player value, like if I could assess it to like a singular you know, player out there that could be on the market, I think Dorian Finney-Smith is probably like right around this value in terms of what this pick is. Uh, they would obviously have I to I think I would trade to... the, the 17 pick for Dorian Finney-Smith. Yeah. And like th- that would require the Nets to figure out what they want to do. Right. Like I've heard rumors <laughs> of the Nets trying to get <laughs> in this draft, podcast. right? That's a whole other podcast. Uh, yeah. Like, but I think the Nets do want to get into this draft in some way, shape or form. I get the impression they want to keep Mikael Bridges. Uh, you know, they have a lot of these guys, uh, Mikael Bridges, Cam Johnson, Dorian Finney Smith, like you can go up and down their lineup. They have like these big wings that, can come in and you know hit threes and defend on some level and i do wonder if they could look into that potentially whether or not they would you know trade dorian like the deal that makes all the sense in the world to me for both sides would be dayron sharp and dorian finney smith for rui achimura 17 and like something else on the lakers side you could you know potentially get an answer at the center position with dorian or with uh dayron sharp who in limited minutes has been really valuable for the Nets, like when he's been able to play. Uh, Certainly Dorian Finney-Smith, I think, would step in, be really, really valuable. Uh, And then if the Nets want to continue to, like, be attractive in some way for a star, I wonder if they would actually see value in Rui uh, coming their direction in order to, you know, showcase, hey, instead of having like another three and D guy, we have like a bench scoring forward, right. Who maybe fits a little bit better with Cam Johnson and Mikhail Bridges than Dorian Finney Smith was. Maybe there's a little bit less redundancy there uh, in terms of, you know, team build. Right. So I think it would cost a little bit more than that on the Lakers side. I don't know what that would be necessarily. I'm not going to like sit here and try and, you know, construct a deal uh, in terms of like getting that. Last I, I, like piece, the, right? I like the foundation, uh, the foundation. Yeah. Of the deal is good. I, I like that. I think the foundation of it makes sense to me. Like the Lakers answer a center position question. They get a three and D, you know, guard wing, really wing forward that they could really use. And, you know, they use 17 to fill multiple holes to me. No, I, I like that. Um, so what about 55? Cause you have Bronny James going there uh right now uh <laughs> do do you think he's available at 50 because it felt like coming out of the combine there was a lot of brawny buzz and we, we know how like, of, the of pendulum course there can was. swing like, uh, of course we there just was, need to be but... we need to be honest about this so full transparency right anytime i write about brawny i would say it gets four to five times the page views that anything if i write about any other singular player in this draft right so of course i'm not blaming them of course espn would lean into the Bronny james excitement they have the combine they have the draft there's every reason to do this i'm not saying that like it's dishonest i'm not saying anything negatively toward it it just makes sense to build like anticipation and buzz regarding Bronny. Look, I didn't get the impression that like he I, I think that he may have moved the needle a little bit for people just in terms of he didn't look like totally lost out on the court in the five on five, which was good. But like he didn't like blow anybody away in the five on five. Like Baylor Shireman was like super impressive in the five on five and really helped himself. And it was probably going to be a first round pick. Right. Uh, 
you know, there are a couple other players that really helped themselves. I, I think Bronny helped himself by not looking lost, but like they didn't, you know, totally move the needle to where here, here's the thing, Jovan. If Bronny James gets drafted and I think he will be drafted because I think the Lakers would take him at 55 if he's there because it's 55, it's a throwaway pick, make LeBron happy. It makes all the sense in the world to do this. I'm not saying that like there's probably a degree of nepotism involved, but I, I don't think that it's a bad thing for them to lean into that. If he is the, if he gets drafted, he will be, I believe the first player six foot one or shorter to be a one and done that averages five points or fewer per game. I believe that that is accurate. I went through and I looked through all of the everything, uh, like the past names. And I haven't found one that is that small that played one year of college that averaged the production that Bronny did that has been drafted before. And it's okay to acknowledge that and say that he's probably not ready for the NBA. I've always thought that like a few years in college, like two to three years in college, I can see a world where Bronny would be ready for the NBA. I like the Devin Carter pathway, I think is instructive for Bronny James in some respect, like Devin Carter went from being this like super athletic, you know, nine point per game scorer who really struggled as a shooter at South Carolina. He transfers to Providence. He's really, really good last year, plays exceptional on defense and then averages 14 points a game. And then this year becomes the biggest player of the year and is like this exceptional, uh, you know, player on both ends of the court. Right. I always thought that that pathway would have been the smartest way to go about it for Bronny. Uh, very similar games athletically in terms of elite athletes. I think Devin's a little bit twitchier. I think Bronny's a little bit stronger than Devin is. Uh, but the thing with Bronny is that right now he can't play point. He is a off guard who is six foot one. Like his ball handling ability and ability to create separation is just not there right now. And he could develop that again. He's very young and I don't like ruling anything out for players, but for me, if I was any organization other than the Los Angeles Lakers, I would be worried about selecting him and me not being the organization that gets the most out of him because I think he is still so far away. He's multiple years away from being able to play on an NBA court, in my opinion. So I would be worried that if I drafted him and used an asset on him, I would be developing him for somebody else basically. But if you're the Lakers and you're planning on having LeBron James for a couple of years still, you can take that chance and it can probably continue to work itself out and give him that leeway that he might need in order to become an NBA player. What what do you see as his ceiling in terms of the draft? Like could cuz I I think again to kind of go back to the combine at that point it was like could he be an early second round pick, late first yeah. round pick. And it seems like that I mean, buzz has no. died down and it's looking more like mid to late second round pick. But like, what, what do you see the highest his ceiling could be in terms of like actual draft slot? Yeah, it would all depend on like, is there an organization? Am I allowed to curse on this podcast? I don't know. Yes. Yes, you are. Uh, is there an organization that wants to fuck with the Lakers? Is kind of the question. Right. Like, does Daryl Morey at 42, 43, whatever pick they have in the second round, just decide, okay, we have all this cap space. We want to try and sign LeBron. We're just going to put the pressure on LeBron and we're going to draft Bronny and we're going to see what happens. Right. Like, it's not impossible to me that something like that happens. Uh, if I was Daryl Morey and like I didn't really care what anybody thought of me, which tends to be Daryl's MO and I don't blame him for it. Uh, I, I don't like this wouldn't stun me by any stretch if he did that. So it's just like a, it's almost like a game of chicken with like a young person's life involved. And I don't love it, but it is almost like kind of a game of chicken. And to me, that's why we saw all of the reporting from Chris Haynes and then ESPN saying that. Uh, you know, he's not taking a two way and, you know, we think he's this, we think he's that, uh, I think it was to try and dissuade teams from 
drafting him unless they're like serious about him uh, as a player and not just as a pawn in the LeBron James sweepstakes. And then the Lakers have a history, recent history of trading up into the early second, you know, early to mid second round, buying a pick or, sure. uh, or whatnot. So are there any names that you've heard attached to them or guys that you think would be good fits in, in the second round, either them again, either trading up or, or purchasing a pick or even at 55 uh, other options other than Bronny? Yeah, look, I, I haven't heard any names for them like moving up, right? I have heard that they would be interested in getting a pick for sure. And that's not a surprise, I think, to anybody. There are a number of teams. So that range from 31 to 40 right now is exceptionally fluid uh, because of the overnight addition to the NBA draft, right? So the NBA draft is two days now. And one piece that was really hard for players that were going through the early entry process uh, back on May 29th was it was really hard for them to get a promise or to get any sort of assurance from anybody in that 31 to 40 range because to those teams were like just very upfront like we don't know if we're keeping our pick right San Antonio's two lottery picks plus 35 do they really want three rookies there Portland has 34 and 40 plus two lottery picks are they going to bring in four rookies probably not right uh, Memphis you know has a roster crunch plus has number nine and 39 um, you know, Toronto has the 31st overall pick, which if I'm, you know, Masai Ujiri and Bobby Webster, I'm thinking that somebody's going to like potentially bowl me over if somebody falls to 31 that we're not expecting. So I would be wanting to keep that pick until, you know, the day of the second day of the draft and then make a move on it. Right. So there are just a number of picks in that range that I think are going to be available. The Knicks pick, you know, number 38, I think they have. Uh, they have 24 and 25, so they're a team that you know probably isn't going to bring in three rookies. And then they also have Rokas Yakubaitis over in Barcelona, who it wouldn't stun me if he tries to come over this year. So, like, there, there's just a num there's so much fluidity there, and I think it would be very plausible for the Lakers to get a pick in that range. I think it would actually be like very, very plausible and easy. If you made me say names, like. You know, Pele Larson at Arizona is an interesting name to me. Kashad Johnson at Arizona is an interesting name to me. Um, I like Antonio Reeves at Kentucky. I think he's just an absolute sniper as a shooter and then has some counters that he'd be able to utilize to be able to get into a floater game if they run him off the line. Uh, I really like Cam Spencer. Uh, Cam Spencer is just one of my favorites in this class. Just an absolute like psychopath competitor in the best possible way and a 40% three-point shooter. I'm really interested as well to see what happens with some of the younger players in this class. You look at guys like Keyshawn George, Cam Christie, Pacom Dadie. Um, you know, Bobby Clintman isn't young, but he's kind of young in the game because he came to basketball later. Uh, you could tell me that those guys go anywhere from like 20 to 40 right now, and I would believe that. Uh, so, like, it'll be really, really intriguing to see kind of where those players fall on draft night and if the Lakers maybe have an interest in trying to swing for the fences if they are able to get a pick in that range and one of those guys is on the board the the last guy I'll bring up to I'm sorry is I, I like a Dembona if they oh, want to no, keep well. I, I love it <laughs> yeah uh, a Dembona you know UCLA fans will be well aware of a Dem you know just the motor is exceptional the, the motor is unbelievable he plays so incredibly hard uh real like flexible in terms of ball screen coverages you can hard hedge him you can blitz with him you can play at the level you can play and drop like he can rim run to a real extent because he's so athletic like he is just the hands are a worry um still at this point but i, I think that he would just make a ton of sense with the lakers as well and then since I have you here, I want to touch on some of the young Lakers and get your mm -hmm. perspective on how those guys are developing. Uh, so let's start with Jalen hood Shafino. He goes number 17 last year, and directly behind him, it's Jaime Jaquez, Brandon Pajemski, and Cam Whitmore, three guys who basically from day one come in and are at least rotation-level guys, if not you know, fringe to, to you know, decent starters. Sure. Uh, and, and then in contrast, uh, JHS – basically doesn't contribute in any meaningful way this year uh, even in garbage time didn't really have a performance where you could point to and be like you know, he had the the 14 points 
in the garbage time game where you saw the flashes of his potential. A lot of times uh, it was like his shot did not look good. It was like yeah. you know, clanking off the backboard and and he you know, talking to people around the team at times. It was like he's playing with blinders and garbage time and uh, just trying to get, you know, create his own offense and, and look for himself. So uh, with that context of his rookie season, also notable had back surgery uh, at the end of the season. Uh, now at the same time, did look pretty good in the G League. Did have a you know, yeah. multi-week stretch there where he was routinely putting up 20-plus points a game and, and high assist numbers, and his shot looked much better. Uh, and now that didn't translate to the NBA level, and that's ultimately what the Lakers are going to be judged on and what JHS is going to be judged on. But with the context of, uh, I don't even want to call it an up-and-down rookie year, I call it rather a, a down rookie year, uh, where are you at with JHS and his development? And is there any sense of optimism or, or promise that you still see with his game that you think could bear out this upcoming season? Yeah, I certainly think there's still promise, but it was a down rookie year. I, I like if they were to move him on the trade market, like I do wonder given the surgery as well, if they would get a first round pick in return for him even this year. Like, I, I don't know that they would, to be honest, but I think he certainly still has promise. I mean, he's a young player that I really liked defensively at Indiana as well. Uh, you mentioned like that on ball, you know, kind of game that he has. The big issue that I saw in the G League more than anything was the turnovers, right? Like it did feel like, again, like you mentioned with him playing in the big team, like even down there, it did feel like it was a little bit blindery at times, which I'm sure was not ideal for anybody involved, especially his teammates. Uh, you know, he did shoot it better. Uh, in the G League, which is really, really important. I think he was up around like 40% from three uh, on yeah. like a reasonable number of attempts, not like a crazy number, but like an okay number. Uh, and yeah, average like 20 points a game. Like there, there, there's definitely promise with young on-ball players that, you know, take some time to develop in the G League. And I definitely wouldn't give up on Hood Shafino at all. I do think that generally he was a polarizing player last year across the league though, even draft time. Uh, I know that he was like consistently ranked in the top 20 of, you know, all of the public boards that people saw, I'm sure, including my own. Like I still have real interest in a guy who can play on the ball and then can play defense in the way that he does. But he was a more polarizing player than what I think was recognized around the league. Like there were teams that saw him more as like a second rounder for sure. Uh, we'll see where he goes, right? Like I, I'm... This year was kind of a write-off, but it often is for on-ball players that enter the league on a team that has real playoff aspirations. Um, I wouldn't rule out him becoming a good player by any stretch. I would have taken Cam Whitmore unequivocally, but I also had a top five grade in the draft on Cam Whitmore. So, like, I, you know, was very different from the NBA. Uh, it, it certainly seems in that respect. You just stuck a knife in the hearts of many Laker fans. Cam Whitmore particularly is the one that bothered a lot of Laker fans that they did not select him. And then uh, there was a game in Houston earlier in the season where he, uh, I think he scored like eight point, eight of the Rockets, yeah. 12 points during a stretch. And it was just like, he was dunking all over that. the Lakers and the <laughs> fans were not happy with that one. Um, what about Maxwell Lewis? Cause I would say, you know, yeah. definitely lower expectations for him compared to JHS. He was always a project just because of the defense. Okay. Like he, he, he has such a long way to go defensively is the thing. Like it's just all, it was always going to take him a long time because coming from Pepperdine, you know, playing for Lorenzo Romar, they they didn't defend anybody, Jovan. Like they they if you go back if you go back and watch those Pepperdine games, like when you actually get some time when the Danny Hurley like thing, you know, goes away and we'll, we'll, we'll touch on to, that when we wrap up here. But yeah. Yeah, you're able to focus on something else. Uh if you go back and you watch like one of those Pepperdine games with Max Lewis, you will just like be staggered by what they were doing defensively. <laughs> it, it was pretty incredible. So I always thought it was gonna take him some time at the end of the day to like kind of mature and become the kind of player that could play on that end of the court at the NBA level. The good news is he's six foot six and has like a seven foot wingspan and he is a super athlete, right? But he's also very skinny. He needs to continue to put on weight, needs to continue to just like get in the film room as much as like get in the, you know, gym and like work on his game. Right. But, you know, it has a chance to become like a, you know, three point shooter that can maybe get to like a decent level, just tools wise on defense, at least like, I, I don't know if 
his awareness and basketball IQ will ever quite get there defensively just because he's starting from a lower level. You have to remember, too, he's one of those guys like Marjan Beauchamp that originally committed to go play for that Chameleon BX program up in San Francisco and then you know that whole thing fell apart due to covid and then like was kind of scrambling a little bit and that's how this guy who's like a top 100 recruit ends up at pepperdine but you know a, a really really interesting player who has a lot of tools athletically and physically that could translate and i i definitely wouldn't rule him out becoming something in the future but i always did think that like this year was definitely a write off and it was why i had him as more of a second round grade was because i thought it was always a little bit more of a project I will say with Maxwell, uh, there were several practices and, and shoot arounds on the road that I can remember that he was among the last people in the gym going over film yep. and working with the Lakers player development people. So I will uh, note that, you know, I think that's noteworthy. Uh, at the same time, I, I do think similar to JHS during crunch time or I mean, uh, garbage time, rather, uh, there were plenty of times where. The shot selection, the seriousness was not ultimately there. I think back on Lakers had a game late in the season in Washington where it was the end of their six game. Uh, I believe it was the, I, I don't think it was the Grammy. I think it was after the Grammy trip, but they, they had this road trip and they finished in Washington and they pulled the starters with a couple minutes left and the bench, mm -hmm. which included Maxwell Lewis, just gives up this 10, 12 point lead. And all of a sudden it's a three point game <laughs> with like 20 seconds left. And yeah. Maxwell Lewis had a late turnover in that one. And the, you know, the coaches yelled at him and it lit into him. And like they, they, they were upset about that. And then uh, what about Max Christie? Uh, because the Lakers have an important decision <laughs> to make with him. Yeah. Uh, he is an impending uh, restricted free agent due to the arenas rule. Uh, and the Lakers, depending on what happens with D'Angelo Russell, what happens with uh, the potential pursuit of a third star, it could be pressing past that first apron up against the second apron and then have to pick between Max Christie and using either uh, the non-taxpayer MLE or the MLE. Uh, Torian Prince is also a free agent, someone that uh, there's been some buzz about them potentially resigning and them potentially having to pick between Prince and Christie. So um, what have you heard about Christie and, and his potential future with the Lakers? Uh, I, I've heard they want to keep him and, and they're going to try to yeah. keep him uh, as I've reported. But uh, and, and then how do you see Christie continuing to develop? Because he's only 21. He's younger than some of the players yes. that are going to go in the first round in this draft. And to me, he's shown like I, I thought he showed flashes his rookie season, continued to show flashes last year. Uh, for whatever reason, what, you know, the Lakers prioritized Cam Reddish, and he was given opportunities ahead of Max Christie. Uh, and, and that was something that, as the Lakers were doing their autopsy on the season, they were not pleased with was uh, the opportunities that Max Christie got versus some of the other young players around the league. Like uh, the, the one I constantly reference is look at Christian Brown in Denver. And with Denver, sure. it was like, we are going to promote him to uh, a, a pivotal bench role and there might be some games where he struggles. We, we might go through some growing pains throughout the season, but we're going to rely on Christian Brown and develop him into being a high level rotation guy. And they committed to him. And I thought yeah. in the playoffs, he played fairly well. And, you know, Denver's bench was shaky overall, but I don't think that was because of Christian Brown. I look at Max Christie in the way that he was handled and really, in my opinion, mishandled for a lot of his first yeah. two seasons um, i think there's a lot of potential there and if i'm a smart team if i'm a rival front office i'm trying to poach max christie I i'm trying yes, to I find a too. way like that's a guy that if i could poach him from the lakers i would do that and the lakers obviously can point to some of the you know like i this could be alex caruso 2.0 if the lakers aren't careful so um yeah, yeah. That, it's a high bar but like I, I i'm just i'm high on max christie and and i know there are several people are with and around the Lakers that are very high on him as well. So what, what has been the buzz that you've heard with Christie and how do you see him continuing to develop, uh, to develop rather as a, uh, so just a young prospect going to be 21 entering his third season? Yeah. So w what I would say on max in, in like comparing him to Christian Brown and, and you know, this is going to sound like I'm like disregarding you, but you'll see in a second that I'm really not, I'm actually making your exact same point. Christian entered the NBA at 21, which is the age that, Max is now, right? Christian was a little bit more ready to play physically than what Max was early in his career. To me, it's more 
Peyton Watson is like the more applicable example of this. Peyton, you know, again, UCLA fans, you know, will know this as well as anybody, like really struggled to get on the court even for Mick Cronin. But you look at the way that they committed to him this year in his second season, and he showed like real tangible growth coming off the bench this year for the Denver Nuggets. And again, like he is, I believe, 21 as well, you know, right around Max's age. Uh, different player, obviously more of like an athletic, you know, slasher driver, whereas Max is going to be like more of a three and D guy. But yeah, like to me, it's more like it's Peyton Watson and like Denver like that, went yeah. through growing pains with Peyton Watson, but they were willing to fight through it, knowing that the benefit could be there. Ultimately, it wasn't in the playoffs. Like they found that they couldn't really play him in important moments in the playoffs. But I think that having him to like eat innings was valuable in the regular season. And those minutes that he got in the playoffs, I think are going to be invaluable for them moving forward as they continue to grow and build and try and get back to that NBA championship that they won last season with Max. Now, I think that he is just a testament to like the total like salary cap mismanagement that unfortunately we've seen a bit of from the Lakers. Uh, you cannot draft a player as young as Max Christie and give him a two year contract. You can't. It's completely inexcusable. There, there is these. It's the same with Taylor Horton Tucker, right? You put yourself in that same Austin exact Reeves. position. Austin Reeves, Austin was at least a little bit older. Although he, so he was a little older, so that's, but yeah. Felt like, yeah, so you at least felt like he might be able to contribute, and you'll know, right? Like, the thing with Austin was, because he was older, if it was going to work, you would know. The thing was, with Austin, where I think they probably screwed up, was, like, they knew that he was good after, like, their summer workouts and stuff. Like, they, they knew that he was a real dude at that point, uh, even before his rookie season. And they still decided to convert them to a two year deals. And like, you know, obviously there's a second side of this, right? Like the player in the agency side are huge. And like, you know, Austin Reeves, Taylor Horton Tucker, Max Christie, th those agents deserve credit for getting those guys on two year deals to get them paid earlier than what they would have otherwise. But I think the Lakers on the other side of that deserve criticism, especially in the case of Max and Taylor, because and look, Taylor Horton Tucker is probably not going to be an NBA player, but they paid Taylor Horton Tucker because they didn't know what he was going to be. And they ultimately chose to pay Taylor Horton Tucker over Alex Caruso because they still didn't know what he was going to be. And they had that uncertainty in terms of what the decision had to be. You know what I mean? Like you have a chance that he could be great. You have a chance he could not be anything really all that valuable, but because you don't know, it creates a real variability in terms of what the outcome is going to be whenever you sign someone to that kind of contract with max again, like if I'm another team, like I am giving max Christie like eight or $9 million a year for at least a couple of years and seeing what it looks like. If max got three years, 30 million, three years, 27, 28 million, that like wouldn't blow my mind because if you're like Orlando and you're looking for depth, like on the wing and you have cap space and you have this young team that Max Christie could grow with and mature, why aren't you throwing Max Christie eight or $9 million a year and just seeing where this grows, right? Uh, he can just literally slot into the money that like Chuma Okiki might've gotten if they decided to retain Chuma Okiki, right? If they, you know, maybe they will, maybe they won't, but like that could be, you know, a very easy idea there. If I'm Detroit and I need a, three and D shooter, like more than anything around Cade Cunningham. Why am I not giving Max Christie like real money? And that's the kind of number at like $9 million a year or so where it becomes really onerous. I think for the Lakers to keep him at that point in terms of yeah. being able to fill out the roster in the way that they want to and not be over that apron level. So Look, I, I'm truly fascinated. Maybe he wants to stay in LA and like he's willing to do something a little bit cheaper. Like maybe they can like convince him that they're willing to give him playing time and they think that like, you know, playing him with LeBron and things like that would be more beneficial for his career. But I, I don't know, man. Like I, I think that I agree with you. I think Max Christie is going to be an NBA player for quite a long time. And I, like I, I just struggle. I struggle to see how they're not going to have to pay, especially with the way that the salary cap is rising and the flashes that he's shown whenever he's been able to get on the court. 
I mean, really, like the only positive I can think of from the situation for the Lakers is that because he's had such an inconsistent role, there isn't the sample. Like, I think if he had been a rotation player all year, uh, like the, there would be multiple suitors at the level that you just talked totally. about in terms of that but, eight to ten million you, dollar range. So, so here's the thing, though. So it's basically another shot at a first round pick. Right. Like I know he yeah. went in the second round this year, but if Max Christie was in this draft, like Max Christie goes in the first round of this draft and he's 21. Right. So you can basically buy a first round pick for $9 million a year, like something like that. That's kind of worthwhile at the end of the day. So if he gets more money than what people are expecting, like that would not surprise me because he's one of the few like real potentially gettable like restricted free agents on the market that are young that you're really like maybe paying to get his prime years for or like what could be like ascending to his prime years. Whereas like a lot of the other free agents on the market this year are over 30 um, or, you know, over 29 at least. And, you know, there's a little bit more complication there in terms of how they will age into a contract that you give them. And the number again with Max, like, you know, for a guy who is as, as unproven as Max Christie is, nine million or so might seem like a lot. But with the way that the salary cap is going, that's just like that's like ninth man money yeah. with what it's gonna yeah. be. So if you think he can at least be that, and if you think there's any upside beyond that, and I think that there is, like if you told me he I, ends I up agree. being a fifth starter, that wouldn't blow my mind. Like yeah. that's that's kind of an easy decision for me to make if I was running a team, but you know, may, maybe the Lakers would match, right? Like that would be totally plausible to me. They decide to let Torian Prince go and, you know, kind of work within the constraints that they build for themselves. Maybe like, honestly, you could let Torian Prince go and trade Jalen Hood Shafino and kind of make up for like a $9 million, like Max Christie uh, contract. But it is kind of a testament to their, decision over the last few years to give out these two-year contracts that they've had to pay these guys and make a decision on them sooner than what they have to. So last one, you've been very generous with your time. Uh, I want to get you out of here on this. You mentioned Dan Hurley, and that has been the dominant storyline over the past week. Uh, I mean, the Lakers coaching search has been the dominant storyline for the Lakers, but this became a national story, uh, a lot of uh, back and forth with what was going on. But uh, just I, I know you, you've talked about this on Hoops Tonight and you, you tweeted about it, but what is your, in, in summary, like what, what's your take on the Dan Hurley situation and just the, the whirlwind of it all? And the fact that the Lakers struck out and looking at the current candidate pool, um, how big of a loss do you think that is? Like forget uh, egg on their face, sure. uh, but actually like not getting Dan Hurley as the head coach in comparison with some of the candidates that have been out there. Um, how big of a loss do you think that is as well? Yeah. So like you say, like, you know, egg on your face or whatever. I, I don't think anybody comes away with this with egg on their face. Like personally, I think that the Lakers chased what is, in my opinion, a likely to be better coaching candidate than anybody else on the market. They decided, in my opinion, to not offer him quite enough money to make it like a real well, that, that's where the egg in the face decision. comes in. I think a little bit but, of just like uh, they made the push, but they didn't make the godfather offer that I think it yeah. would have taken to realistically land him. But you know what, though? Like, yeah, I agree with that. Like, if I was them, like, and I really wanted to chase Dan Hurley before I let this thing get out, like, I'm saying, okay, like, we're understanding we're going to have to offer $16 million a year because at the end of the day, we're going to have to go and be we have to beat what his situation is at Connecticut. We're not trying to compare him to other coaches around the NBA. We have to beat what his situation is where he is exceptionally happy right now. And to do that, like you probably have to overpay in a real way. So I do understand that point. I don't think anybody like really did anything wrong here. Like I think that the first and foremost, it was absolutely real as I'm sure you've kind of shared with people this was absolutely like a real thing for like people that are conspiratorially minded that see like, oh, like Woj, he wrote the book on the Hurleys. He's this, you know, he's that. And you know, this was just a contract play, right? It wasn't that. Like it, it was a genuine consideration. He met with the team. Like there was real uncertainty what he was going to do up until like even like he made the decision on Monday. 
um, from people that were close to him. Right. So I'm not saying that, like he didn't tell anybody. I'm just saying that like this was a real consideration. This was not like some fake thing that was created out of nowhere. Now, in terms of like what all of this means for them, I think Dan Hurley would be an awesome basketball coach in the NBA. Uh, I think that what he's proven with the way that, you know, Jason Tim brought up a really good point to me, like the way that he's proven that he can utilize non spacers and space the court for them, I think would have been like a godsend for somebody like Jared Vanderbilt or for some of the guys that are currently on this roster. I think he would have loved coaching Austin Reeves. I think we would have seen Austin Reeves like explode if he played for Danny Hurley. Um, I think that like, there would have been an adjustment with Dan Hurley to his temperament and like not grinding out every single game, like mentally on some level, like he's, he's somebody that like really cares about like every moment on the court. And like, he would have to make that downshift from what I know from people around him. They seem to think he'd be able to do that. So on some level you lose out on a guy that I think would be a successful NBA coach, but you know, like you're, it's still fine. Like they're going to go out and they're going to hopefully find a coach. It doesn't bother me that they chased him. I think it's reasonable to chase him. It doesn't bother me that they went down this road. I think it was a good candidate to try and chase and we'll see what they do now. Like it, you know, I don't think anybody comes off here as a loser. Like I think that, you know, Dan Hurley went down the road of the NBA, which is something he's always been very clearly interested in. He said it many, many times publicly and he decided that this wasn't the right job for him. The Lakers tried to get a candidate that I think is better than any other candidate on the market. He decided to say no. That doesn't reflect poorly on them, in my opinion. And then, like, you know, the whole Woj of it all, like, Woj is just reporting what he knows. So, like, it's, to me, it's just, like, across the board, it's all fine. Like, it was, it was all okay. It went the way it was supposed to go. And I don't see it as a hindrance it's weird you know we were talking before this like it is weird that they're coming up on like two months you know what i mean it, it's a little bit weird they're coming up on two months without a coach but i mean the, the draft's in two weeks right like yeah and it, and in theory odd. they're not gonna have someone to we're, again recording this wednesday evening pacific time they're probably not gonna have someone in place by friday so you would think that pushes it to monday at the absolute earliest and then you have like 10 days to yeah. you know yeah, a li little bit under two weeks to to plot not only your plan at the draft but uh, again we're talking about are you making a, a draft day trade for a significant piece to upgrade your roster and then a few days after that you're starting for agency so like uh i think that's not ideal timing like it, certainly like i mean you got to make the best of it and, and it's just like hire someone as soon as you can but i think i ideally if you're the lakers you would have had someone in place by like late may early june and then you have like a month or so runway to figure out the draft and figure out free agency but now they're kind of pushing against the clock yeah i don't know like i guess to me that you know your front office is going to be the one that's like you know ranking and you know stacking your free agency targets and your draft prospects right and you sure. know when you hire a coach the coach can come in and have opinions on that stuff and the downside is the coach would not be there for draft workouts but like there are some situations where that can be a negative. There are some where it can be a positive, <laughs> right? Like it's, it's yeah. good and bad from time to time. So like, uh, to, yes, I think the bigger thing for this team specifically is like having somebody in place that has real, has a real sense of like what they want to do in free agency and like has a real sense of like what kind of scheme they want to run, what, you know, how do they want to go about playing uh, with LeBron James and Anthony Davis and Austin Reeves is like your core trio moving forward. Um, you know, the, the big decision here is obviously like whatever D'Angelo Russell decides to do too. Like we just don't, I haven't heard anything about what he's going to do on his player option yet. So it's we a big will, domino. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's the domino that like can shape a lot of what their off season is. And we don't know what that mm -hmm. is yet. So, uh, you know, their, their board is probably going to change based on that decision, even in free agency in terms of the guys that they chase. So to well, me, like he, he doesn't have to decide before the draft too, is the, the unfortunate totally. part for them. Yeah. So like they just need to make a decision on um, their coach. And I think that as long as it happens by like the middle of next week, I think it's okay at the end of the day. Like it, it can't extend much past like 
Friday of next week, in my opinion, because you still do want that week of lead up time before free agency to be able to like really consider Mm -hmm. a lot of different options. But yeah, like uh, to me, like it's still okay. It's not ideal that they're still chasing a coach, but like it's, it's not catastrophic yet by any stretch. Well, look, if they need to catch up on the draft and the different prospects and who would make sense <laughs> for them, they need to check out your draft guide. I think we, we've landed the plane here. Um, so they need to subscribe to The Athletic and check out your draft guide. But uh, Sam, we, we went over and, and I appreciate you uh, giving us your time today. It was short notice, but I'm glad we made this work. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. It's always worth uh, talking and going over time and having a good time with you, Yovan. So no, this was easy and uh, it was an easy lift. Now that the draft guide is off my plate. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, I'm glad we did it. Uh, it was a really good time. Where can the good people find you? Go to The Athletic. Uh, subscribe whenever the draft guide comes out. Uh, it's you know a labor of love. It's like 150,000 words on prospects. Like you'll get to know it's a, lot a bunch of, words. of things like background intel and um like everything that gets gathered in that thing and obviously strengths weaknesses you know what i think of them as prospects but really the key is like you can make your own determinations based off the strengths and weaknesses like i try and make it so that you know i'm like i'm not the guy who knows everything about prospects but you know i know how to scout and know how to evaluate at this point and you know you guys i have my opinions but you know by all means like use it to form your own opinions um you know, and then Game Theory Podcast, like, oh, subscribe on YouTube, subscribe to whatever podcast platform you listen to it on. Uh, really, really good. You know, we, we're trying to do some prospect interviews as well. I've got like four of them recorded. I think I've got like three more over the weekend and then trying to get, you know, three more even after that for next week. So, you know, hopefully we'll have a bunch of those that you can, you know, hear from players and have a really good time with. So, yeah. Well, subscribe to The Athletic, subscribe to the Game Theory Podcast. And I can say for as long as I've had an athletic subscription, the first thing that happens when I'm covering a team and they draft a player or they trade for uh, a pick (laughs) is I go to the draft guide and I pour over it and I try to learn as much as possible about that prospect. So shout out to Sam. Make sure you check that out whenever the Lakers uh, draft uh, or whoever. we'll see. We'll, we'll see if they have the 17 pick, 55 pick or somewhere in between. Uh, but that'll do it for today's show. Barring a coaching update over the next 48 hours, I will be back uh, on Monday. But uh, thank you guys for watching and listening. And I will talk to you soon.